we now go forward in consciousness on our planet, which I feel is going from the third dimension to the fifth dimension. The real truth will spark a spiritual revolution and heal our planet. Everybody that's on Earth? It's definitely have changed my life. Once you understand how the world really works. Even my mother. DNA, and to have great enjoyment doing the it. The deepest secrets within man, DNA repairment, full body activation. Teaching us about unlocking our unlimited potential, our life's purpose. But just know that we're actually here, we're real people. How do you turn on the DNA? That's a good question. Very good question. All walks of life. Accessing and embodying the metaphysical knowledge to truly be the masters of our reality. Into the highest states of consciousness. Energetically, physically, mentally, and spiritually to help you break through all realities. It's the peak of self-mastery. It's also the epitome of what unity really is. At the end of the day, it all starts with you. The way back to myself. Oh, many of you have missions. Homeless. Sending you so much love. Purposes. Homeless. But you all come for love. Homeless. And so a new civilization is being born. What the churches, the religions may have hidden away. This is the advancement of your DNA. American culture is awash in schemes for self-improvement. We are taught to be mindful, to think positively, to believe in ourselves, and we will not only vanquish our anxieties and alienation, but find success and an elusive happiness. This $4 billion industry with its some 100,000 book titles, workshops, online courses, magazines, documentary films, apps, and lucrative conference circuit thrives, however, on doublespeak. It celebrates self-centered freedoms while ignoring the loss of our political and economic freedoms that are the true source of our disenfranchisement and often our depression. Mindfulness, along with disciplines such as positive psychology, are designed to condition us to uncritically accept the cruelty of the corporate capitalist structure and blame ourselves for any inability to adjust. Joining me in the studio to discuss capitalism's most effective ideological tool for conformity is Ronald Purser, the author of McMindfulness, How Mindfulness Became the New Capitalist Spirituality. Explain what mindfulness is and, uh, and, and what it purports to do. Well, mindfulness from the Buddhist tradition was always grounded fundamentally in a moral and ethical vision, which was the foundation of the practice. And what's happened is that mindfulness has been extracted from a grounding in that ethical uh, and moral tradition and turned into a utilitarian and instrumental technique uh, which is unmoored from any kind of ethical and moral commitments. So it's basically been morphed uh, into a tool, into a technique which can be used for any particular purpose and instrumental aim. And you know, mindfulness is not a neutral technique or a tool. It's fundamentally integrated as a, as a path of spiritual development. It's now performing an ideological function uh, by uh, privatizing. First of all, uh, the view is that stress is all inside our heads. It has nothing to do with the political and social and economic right. context. But let me just go back because you know I think for people who don't understand mindfulness, uh, the way it's been decontextualized, you write, is that it's essentially become nothing more than basic concentration training. Um, although derived from Buddhism, it's been stripped of its teaching, as you mentioned. And it's about essentially giving people breathing and meditative skills in order to integrate themselves into systems that may in fact, well, and I think largely do, uh, contribute to the very anxiety and alienation they're trying to overcome. Right. It becomes a palliative, basically, uh, a way to uh, de-stress and basically uh, re-enter uh, the rat race uh, to basically go back into uh, toxic corporate cultures, for example, which are not notoriously uh, fraught with uh, uh, you know, long hours, job insecurities, uh, bullying. Uh, you know, people don't have autonomy or discretion over their work. 
And so mindfulness provides, you know, sort of a time out, uh, but really with no sort of critical questioning of what are the causes of, of these toxic but, but isn't it worse because if you're alienated and, and uh, have, are discontented and depressed, it's your problem. It's, it, the onus is put upon you. The onus is put upon individuals. It basically is individualizing these social and political problems and blaming the victim in some way, saying, look, uh, it's your problem. You have to adapt. Right. You have to adjust to these conditions. Uh, so it deflects attention away from these more critical questions of the structural and systemic injustices and problems that are generating this cultural malaise that we're all feeling. And, and that is really appealing uh, to institutions such as corporations and the military well, you have and schools. Major institutions, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Apple, um, they've all incorporated this uh, technique, whatever you want to call it, into their corporate structures um, and you call it you know a religion of the self right I think it's functioning functioning as a new secular religion so they would have what a an hour a day or something when they how would it physically work within the corporate structure usually it's a, a program of sorts that attend uh, uh, employees will attend maybe an hour a day for eight weeks and then they're trained in the technique basically and the technique what are they actually doing? A lot of it's about breathing. A lot of it is focusing on your breath, learning how to calm down, learning how to uh, monitor your reactions. Uh, there's sort of a, a, a kind of an acceptable bandwidth of, of affect of, and emotions that you're, you're basically norm, normative, normatively taught. Uh, you know, so if you have anger coming up or irritation, you know, Okay, let's uh, try to monitor that. And every time, I mean, this and, and we mentioned before, this is a billion-dollar industry. I know. The selling point is productivity. The selling point is performance, isn't it? That's exactly how uh, these programs are pitched and sold, especially when it comes to corporations. That uh, that is the selling point. That's the only way they can get it in the door. You have to remember that it's management that are management that's buying these programs. Right. You call uh, it the entrepreneurial equal of McDonald's. Pretty much. And it's basically the quantification, the standard, standardization, you know, turning everything into uh, predictable control, efficiency, uh, you know, one size fits all. You write, laissez-faire mindfulness lets dominant system decide such questions as the good. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is because there is no real ethical and moral vision uh, tied to commercial and commodified forms of mindfulness, what happens is when you uh, contextualize it, let's say, within a uh, company or corporation, then it, basically the default is whatever uh, the values uh, of that uh, institution, they're going to drive how that mindfulness program is, is utilized and how it's uh, uh, repurposed basically uh, you know so it you know it could be used to increase productivity as we were talking about um, there it's really kind of well let the market decide what the good is uh, it, it, you quote uh, Byung Chul Han if I yeah. have that correctly he calls this uh, uh, he used the term psychopolitics uh, in which contemporary capitalism seeks to harness the psyche as a productive force. That's, in essence, what's happening. Yes, I mean, we, when we started with Taylorism, for example, what did Just we harness? Just explain for people well, who don't for know what Taylorism Frederick, is. Well, Frederick Winslow T Taylor was uh, the father of what was called scientific management. Uh, back in the factory days, the early factory system, uh, they wanted to increase efficiency and productivity, and so through time and motion studies, through uh, standardization of task, fractionating task, we can retrain uh, physical laborers to perform the task in the most efficient manner. And so we harnessed their bodies. Uh, and then in the 1920s and the 1930s, we realized, oh, wait a minute. Um, people actually have feelings, they have emotions, uh, they have needs for belonging. And so that was insufficient. And so then we had to find ways to tap into uh, people's sense of their needs, their needs for fit, for belonging to a, a corporation, a company, 
Uh, and that, that was the work of Elton Mayo uh, at Harvard. It was called the Human Relations Movement. And so that, that trajectory was then tapping into, you know, how do we, uh, uh, how do we uh, suppress dissent in ways by making people feel they, they belong to the company. We can uh, care for them by asking them how they're feeling, you know, be a sensitive supervisor. Uh, but this long tradition in management science, I'll put that in quotes, has always been to yoke the subjectivity of the worker to the interest of capital. And so now we see knowledge workers, professional workers. Uh, and so now we're actually trying to, to uh, control how people use their mental capital. So mental capital has now become uh, the new asset that we have to harness. I want to go back to Bayang Chul Han. He writes, I think quite presciently, you quote him in the book, endlessly working at self-improvement resembles the self-examination and self-monitoring of Protestantism, which represents a technology of sub subjectification and domination in its own right. Now, instead of searching out sins, one hunts down negative thoughts. Yes, yes, I think that's uh, uh, an update, uh, uh, Protestant work ethic 2.0, or if you want to call it that. Um, so yeah, so that basically kind of creates a uh, acceptable bandwidth of what's allowed in, in the workplace. So we don't want people really speaking up. We don't want people uh, objecting to uh, toxic working conditions, unfair working conditions. And we can kind of manage people's emotions and keep them uh, basically uh, docile and uh, pacified. It's a form of internal pacification. Right. So people are self-policing, they're self-regulating themselves. When Zizek writes about this movement, as you quote Zizek, uh, he said it's establishing itself as the hegemonic ideology of global capitalism. It helps people to fully participate in the capitalist dynamic while retaining the appearance of mental sanity. But at its core, what it's really doing is ab absolving people of moral responsibility, in essence, isn't it? That's right. And uh, because people can learn how to de-stress and focus on themselves uh, in order to function better uh, within the status quo. So uh, it's very accommodationist in orientation. Uh, and so it deflects attention away from these questions about uh, the larger socio and economic and political issues which are causing such uh, 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 epidemics of stress in society. And this gets in, you quote Foucault, uh, the difference between what he calls techniques of domination administered from the outside and techniques of the self, which are administered from the inside. So it's this kind of symbiotic form of control. Right. It makes uh, individuals more governable. Uh, so they're uh, basically uh, self-policing themselves rather than uh, it having to come from external authorities. Well, it's the external forms of repression are in essence masked. They're masked and becomes kind of insidious and obscured. Uh, and it's all done within sort of the pretense of uh, I'm freely choosing. This is a free choice. And this goes back to how it's tied uh, to neoliberalism in terms of how neoliberal uh, ethos is seeping into shaping a particular subjectivity, a particular self that is uh, adapting uh, to the neoliberal order. And that's why, as uh, Ruth Whitman points out again, who you quote, uh, this movement, like the positive psychology movement, is uh, often being funded by the most retrograde forces of American capitalism. Right, such as the Templeton Foundation. Explain who they are. The John Templeton Foundation is... Which has a staggering amount of money. A staggering uh, amount of money. Uh, uh, like a billion dollars or something they hand Right, and they, they promote uh, research and techniques that uh, somehow uh, conjoin the idea of individual uh, freedom of the market with spiritualities. Uh, it then turns into a therapeutic technique which focuses on uh, the self and that deflects attention away then from asking more critical questions about social and economic and political causes of 
uh, societal uh, problems. Um, and, and so we don't really think about uh, how we can actually come together as collectives in solidarity with other people to, to really solve the sources of the social origins of suffering. Because now we're focusing on a highly privatized individualistic uh, form of mindfulness, which really masks and kind of deflects away these sort of other alternative explanations for the problems that we're experiencing. Instead, everything is sort of therapized. It's basically right. turned into, uh, oh, you know, it's your problem. You have to adjust. You have to cope. You have to adapt. It's basically operating as a form of social control because it's advocating for a certain acceptable bandwidth like and norms of what emotions are acceptable in our various uh, uh, public institutions, private and public institutions. So, if I, for example, if I'm experiencing anger, uh, I'm supposed to monitor that and... Uh, Even if that anger is justified. Right, I mean, and so that's how it's become... In a way, it's never justified under mindfulness, or the way it's taught. Right? Yeah, unfortunately, that's, that's right. And which is really counter to, uh, you know, even the Dalai Lama said, look, anger can be justified in certain circumstances. Uh, there's a, what we call wrathful compassion in the Buddhist tradition. Compassion isn't all being, you know, accept, uh, all, you know, accepting and nice and, and everything. No, there's times when, you know, we have to raise the sword of compassion. Well, if you're not angry at injustice and cruelty right. and suffering and oh, something's wrong with you. Um, yeah. But of course, that's what they're trying to wash out.